Thank you, Francesca, and thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. I must admit, I'm terrified that I'm talking to a group of people who make sculpture. I can only talk about it. I certainly cannot sculpt anything. So please, you will have to bear with me. I think the one thing we have in common is that we both love sculpture, the audience and myself, and I hope that will carry it. So I think if we can start with the first slide. There are certain monuments that define a city or even an entire country. For instance, I don't know, the Eiffel Tower in Paris or the Statue of Liberty here in New York. But if there is something that is, talks to the entire world, I think it's the Acropolis in Athens, the citadel of ancient Greece and ancient Athens. Not only that, but especially the Parthenon, the temple that stands so very obviously on top of this sacred rock right here. Now, the Parthenon is so familiar to us that we have taken it as the epitome of a Greek temple. We assume that all Greek temples should more or less look like the Parthenon. But the more we study it and the more we realize how very different it is, how anomalous, how itself, even though there were some precedents on the Acropolis, but its plan turned out to be completely innovative. It came at a time when the Athenians were feeling wonderful because they had defeated the Persians and they had a great deal of money that had come to them through the tributes to the Delian League. The year was 447, and we know it exactly because the Athenians wrote a great deal, and therefore they engraved everything on big stone slabs from year to year, the name of the supervisors, the names of the workers, the amount of money that was being spent, what was being done from time to time. So we have been fortunate enough to find most of these accounts, and therefore we know how long it took to make the Parthenon, and what went into it. It was made in a very short span of time, despite the fact that it is entirely of marble. It was made between 447 and 432 BC, and that is the time that we associate with the leadership of Pericles, the great statesman who was a man of the arts, a friend of philosophers, and was very interested in any form of culture, and was determined to make Athens the school of Hellas. Now, the Parthenon is normally considered a Doric temple. But it really isn't completely Doric. It has a variety of features that are really not entirely Doric. True enough, the columns of the outer colonnade are in the Doric order. And so are the columns of the very shallow porches, themselves unusual. There are also Doric columns in the interior, but you already see a first departure here. The cella itself, the core room of the temple, is much wider than usual. And the colonnades that were used to support the roof, instead of going straight front to back as normal in earlier temples, this time they form a sort of pie shape because they form a frame for the cult image that was an absolutely splendid creation in gold and ivory, the Athena Parthenos, the virgin goddess that was the patroness of the city. And then there was an extra room that again is very anomalous. And here you already begin to have elements of the Ionic order because these huge columns go all the way to the ceiling instead of being in two orders as those of the main cella. And this room itself was called the Parthenon and eventually the name extended to the entire building. So this was probably a treasure room a place where they kept all the gold, all the objects that were donated to the goddess, all the tribute, a veritable bank, as it were. No, <laughs> it's no surprise that many of the early banks of the United States are in the Doric order and look like temples, because in fact, the idea was very much the same. We are told that the architect was a man called Dictinus. There was another architect working with him, it was called Callicrates, and then with Carpion, they wrote a book about it. Even in those days, they wrote a book about things. But the one who was supervising everything, as we learned from the ancient sources, was Phidias. And Phidias was particularly known for his sculptures. He sculptures in bronze, he sculptures in marble, but especially, and this is really remarkable, is sculptures in gold and ivory, which requires not only very expensive materials, but also very difficult materials to work with. And this is why the centerpiece of the whole temple was this tremendous image of Athena. But the temple itself is what primarily has attracted our attention because this is really what remains. 
Here, for instance, you see another ionic touch. This is a section that shows the Doric columns of the outside. There were eight on the two short fronts. They were 17 on the long sides. Then these are the columns of the shallow porches. And on the outside, you have the typical Doric arrangement of metopes and triglyphs, what forms the Doric frieze. We shall see this in greater detail later. And you also have sculptures in the gables, the pedimental sculptures. But then, at this particular point here, you had a continuous frieze. And this is the famous Parthenon frieze that ran all around four sides of the building in a continuous, enormous procession with uh, hundreds of figures that, to this day, baffles us in that we cannot be 100% sure of what it represents. And there have been interpretations proposed practically every year lately because it has excited so much interest since they are now rebuilding the Parthenon and they are trying to re-erect some of the pieces, some of the fragments of the structure. In a day of festival, when you had the great Panathenaic festival that served for the whole of Attica, there were the hecatombs, that is to say the hundred animals, the hundred cows and oxen that were brought up to the Acropolis and were sacrificed and people shared in the meat and shared in the festive atmosphere. This was the first sight you saw when you came through the great gateway, the Propylaia, the temple seen not straight on, but actually at a diagonal so that you could take in at a glance the vast expanse of the columns. It had everything decorated. And here again, we take it for granted, but this is unusual. Other temples did not have this wealth of sculptural decoration. But here you can see the metopes, they all carried their own subject. The gables were filled with figures that toward the center were well over life size because of the tremendous size of the building. And here you can see some of the human figures to give an idea of what the scale of the building was. And then eventually even victorious generals and emperors put up their own shields on the architrave of the building to increase the effect. And all of this has to be visualized painted because the ancient always painted their sculpture and their architecture, bringing out details that would articulate the structure. In the fifth century after Christ, the great temple was turned into a church. And this started creating dis disruption within the building. First of all, what was the main entrance for the Greek temple, the east side, had to be now the place for the Christian altar. And therefore, an apse was thrown into the columns of the shallow porch, and a window was opened up in this gable in order to project light onto the altar. Well, then, major entrances had to be opened on this side, and the cross wall that had defined the Parthenon proper had to be knocked down, and stairways were established so that people could go up on a gallery. And images of saints were painted on the wall. And if you today go to Athens, you can still see some traces of some of these saintly images on the wall, of course, very faint by now. Not only that, but the Christians decided that they were going to object to the images that were all around the building. We know that the metopes on the north side describe the last night of Troy. We know that the metopes on the west side describe the battle of the Athenians or the Greeks versus the Amazons. We know that the east side described the battle of the gods and the giants, all subjects that had particular relevance for the Athenians, and we will discuss them later on. They damaged and defaced most of them. The only ones that they didn't touch were the metopes on the south side, because they represented the battle between men and centaurs. And for some reason, the Christians thought that that was an allegory of the inner struggle of man who has good and evil within himself. And so they left them on. And this is why those are the best preserved right now. But they erected a steeple. This is the size of the campanile. And in many ways, completely altered the appearance of the Parthenon. Then it was turned into a mosque. And you can see the minaret here at the time when the Turks took over Athens. So you can see that each religion was trying to make its own imprint, to make its own stamp on the building that was so prominent and so important. But at some point, there was a siege by the Venetians, the Venetians of Morosini, in 1687. 
And the Turks had stored a great deal of ammunition in the building. And in this drawing that purports to have been made at the time, you can see that one of the cannonballs of Morosini fell into the Parthenon, lit all the ammunition, and there was a major explosion. So the Parthenon that had already been damaged, you can see here the window that had been opened by the Christian on the east side, and that had already been intruded upon by the various types of churches, now became a destroyed shell. And when you go to Athens today, this is what you basically see. You see an empty shell. They have re-erected many of the columns, and now in a great project that tries to refurbish the Acropolis and the Parthenon, they are trying to put up even some of the inner details. But you can see what the interior of the building looks like. This, for the moment, is a transparent building, as it were. No real walls standing to block out the light. And because we are so taken with the love of the ruins, we find it very romantic and we like it this way. And there is nothing more appealing than climbing up the Acropolis and go sit near the Parthenon on the night of the moonlight when they let you go into the Acropolis at night. On the other hand, this is really not what the Parthenon should have looked like in antiquity. This is the ruin that you have right now. And most of all, of course, we don't have the golden ivory statue that was in the center and which was the masterpiece. So we have focused on the sculpture that is left. And because we know the name of Phidias connected with it, we have been trying to say, oh, this is so particularly good that it has to be by the hand of the master himself. And that's our eagerness to find the imprint of the master, as it were, since we know that he was involved. This is one of the metopes that shows the battle of centaurs, half horse, half men, and lapids and Greeks. And uh, the particular arrangement is perhaps formulaic, because this had to be seen from a great distance. You can see that this is very high relief, but it is way up on the building. But what we are missing out, of course, now are the colors. The background of the metope would have been painted. The mantle of the youth would have been painted so that the naked body stood out against it. The features of the face would also have been painted. And maybe the horse's body would have been mottled, and there would have been extra accessory, and this would have been very vivid. The metopes of the south side are still somewhat severe in style. That is to say, the phase that we associate with the period around 460, because they were probably the first to be made. They were prepared before the building was really completely underway. But because of their position, they had to be put in place early enough. This is, in fact, one of the metopes that was still in place. And uh, it couldn't be taken down by Lord Delgin. This is another episode in the story of the Parthenon. At the turn into the 19th century, around 1801, Lord Elgin, who was an emissary to the Supreme Court in Turkey, had permission to take down the marbles of the Parthenon. And you all know that many of them are in the British Museum and that there has been this great controversy over the Elgin marbles, the so-called Elgin marbles, because Greece wants them back. Elgin could not take this one, the man of Lord Elgin, because this was so firmly embedded in the corner of the Parthenon, the southwest corner, that it would have been too difficult to bring down. And again, we have focused on it and said this is one of the most marvelous. For the moment, it looks as if the lapis is losing, as if he's been choked to death by the centaur who is hitting him with a branch. But if you notice that there is a hole there, right next to the thigh of the horse, of the horse's body, then you realize that the young man had a long spear or skewer with which he was transfixing the centaur, so that this is a much more even battle than you might realize. And what is so impressive is the contrast between the limp or almost limp body, the very vigorous center, and the impressionistic effect of a face that cannot be seen in its entirety. This is a novelty for the Greeks. The Greeks tended to show you everything. Here, instead, they are hiding it and making it perhaps even more horrible because you can't see it. And by horrible, I mean look at the contracted brows, look at the prominent aquiline nose, look at the fierce expression of the centaur. This is something that is new in Greek art that tended to idealize figures. And of course, these being centaurs, they were monsters, and therefore they did not need to be idealized, whereas a human being would have been much more impassive. So we thought, well, maybe this is by Phidia. Some people have said, maybe this is by Myron. Again, the desire to find the great name. 
Here are some more of these metopes. These were those that were taken by Lord Elgin, and you can see them here in this old photograph taken in the British Museum, because this display now is somewhat different. And here are some of the figures that were part of the East Gable that, according to the sources that we have from antiquity, depicted the birth of Athena from the head of Zeus. I particularly want to call your attention to this group, and then we will analyze very briefly these three figures. Because this is the sun god that is emerging from the waves, announcing the new day for the birth of Athena. And up the opposite corner, way out here, that would have been the moon going down. But look where the sun is coming from. He's coming from the base of the gable. He's coming from the cornice of the pediment. You can only see his very powerful arms holding the reins of the horses. And then on the body of the horses, there is a wavy pattern that would have been painted blue and would have made it absolutely clear that the sun was rising from the waves of the Mediterranean. Here you can see it on the pediment itself, on the gable, you can see how the slope requires that the figure be scrunched down as much as possible, and yet the artist went to the trouble of depicting the rippling waves as the sun emerges to create the effect of the new dawn. And here, in these three figures, you have some of the discoveries of the high classical, the fifth century. This image, and I am not going to go into identifications, is obviously a young goddess who is coming running to announce the birth of Athena. And basically, she is static. She is a statue. There is nothing else. She can't move. But she is in motion. She is almost like a skater gliding. This is because the drapery has been used to create the effect of motion. And this is what we call the motion line, a line that moves by itself, that waves, so that the, it's almost as if the wind were pushing it back against the human form that is underneath. This was one of the discoveries of fifth century Athens. On the contrary, here, you have another discovery. You have the modeling line, the line that doesn't go along the body, thus flattening the figure, but goes across the forms, thus modeling the underneath. So this, again, is an achievement that if we had time to look at earlier pieces of sculpture, we could see why this is a further development. But you can already see here. And even more impressive is the fact that these figures are well over life size, and they are cut out of a single block of marble. Here, at the opposite side of the same gable, you have other goddesses that are reclining. This probably Aphrodite, because she just looks so voluptuous in the lap of what might be Artemis. We are changing all our interpretations. And here, not only do you see the modeling line, the line that goes across the forms so that you can understand the body underneath, but you also have a special type of drapery that clings so fiercely to the body that you almost have the impression that it is wet. For the longest time, this, in romantic terms, were called the Dew Sisters as if they had been staying out at night and become completely drenched with the dew, the Tausch Westerns of the Germans. And you notice how the breast is, for instance, almost entirely revealed because the folds surround it instead of cutting across it so that you here have the effect almost of nakedness, whereas the color, the paint, let's not forget that these were painted. The paint would have told you very clearly that that part was covered and that it is just the sleeves of her chiton that is falling down as she reclines in the lap of the other figure. So is this realistic drapery? No, it isn't. Drapery does not behave like this in life. On the other hand, this is terrific artistry. These figures, again, cut out of one enormous block of marble, are the epitome of what we consider the peak of Greek sculpture. Nowadays, we no longer think in terms of a primitive beginning, then a rise to a peak, and then a decline. We see each period as being important for itself. And so we cannot say that this is the best that the Athenians or the Greeks could produce. But we do see that this is tremendous sculpture that is really very impressive sculpture. Again, we would like to see the hand of Phidias here, except that by chronology, because of those building accounts, we know that Phidias was not even any longer in Athens at this time. But he might have had a hand 
in the making of the frieze, at least in the cartoons that he might have drawn onto the slabs that had to be put in place before the roof was in place, otherwise there would have been no way of slipping them in position. And here too you notice other achievements of the period. The age differentiation between this figure, who is probably Poseidon, and therefore elderly, he held a trident in his hand that was either painted or added in metal, and the young god here, who is probably Apollo. Apollo wears a wreath, and you can see the attachment holes because the wreath would have been in metal. And uh, you can tell the difference between the youthful, pudgy hand of Apollo and the veined hand of the older man. So again, age differentiation, which before had not been so obvious and had not been so clear. This, again, a masterpiece. But what everybody remembers most of the Parthenon frieze, of course, are the fantastic horses, the very fiery horses of the great cavalcade that goes all around the building with the warriors and the young men in various types of attire, some of them even wearing animal skins, the horses rampant in almost impossible position. You have the impression that they are performing special feat of equitation because you can see that they're standing on only one leg or two legs. And it, once again, we try to see in this beautiful figure where the head is now lost through the acid, through the acid rain, but it uh, remains in a cast, we thought that this might have been carved by Phidias himself, the only elderly man in the whole cavalcade trying to restrain a horse so that for quite a while it was said, this is Pericles trying to control the Athenian democracy. It is not, if we can be sure that that is a rom romantic interpretation. But the point remains that this fantastic horse and this a uh, wind-blown warrior with his peculiar cap with a tail, uh, an ancient David Crockett, and uh, his fluttering mantle is certainly a great creation of this building. So we said Phidias, Phidias. We wanted to see Phidias everywhere. And now we have come to the realization that maybe Phidias didn't really do anything of all of these. That architectural sculpture, important and beautiful as it is, was done by a number of masters who were perhaps Phidias disciples, who were very good themselves, but were not the major focus of attention on the building. What Phidias was really doing in all that period was making the statue. Because a statue in golden ivory, a statue with 42 feet tall, a statue that comports an enormous amount of details in the decoration, is something that requires an enormous amount of time and activity. And you can see here in this section of the building how the inner colonnade in two levels creates a frame around the figure. The statue, moreover, recalled everything that had been put on the outside of the temple because she carried the great shield on the outside of which was the battle of Greek and Amazon in relief. In the interior of the shield was the battle of the gods and giants it was the same thing that was on the east side metope. She had an enormously elaborate helmet. She was wearing the aegis, the great protective shield that had been given to her by her father Zeus. On the soles of her sandal was engraved the battle of Greeks and centaurs. And on her hand rested the figure of victory, Nike, come to crown Athena, because Athena, as you can see, has finished fighting her spear is at rest, and Nike declares that she has won. Well, Phidias was making the statue, as we know from the accounts, in about eight years, from 447 to 438. In 438, the building accounts tell us that they are selling off the surplus of ivory and gold. And after that, he had become so famous that he went to Olympia, where he created another great masterpiece of antiquity, the Zeus of Olympia. So we know that whatever else he did, he did not do the sculptures of the Parthenon such as we had understood it, even though the inspiration was there. But the Athena was, of course, lost in gold and ivory. You can imagine how it was not only fragile, but easily looted. At some point, we know that the gold was taken off because they were trying to mean coinage for a tyrant. We only have echoes 
in what you might consider the souvenirs that you can buy if you go, I don't know, to Washington and you get a little statue of uh, Lincoln or things like this, or a little statue of liberty here in New York. And we have to be content with these echoes from the past, even though they are enormously uh, simplified as compared to the original and don't have the appeal of the great gold and ivory materials. We know that there were fires in the building, and you can well imagine how the fire would destroy the ivory. Moreover, when it was turned into a Christian church, Athena would have been immediately taken down even if she had survived. So what can we rely on? This is a statue which is about one meter high, about this high from my podium. Um, that is in Athens, it was made during the time of the Roman Antonine Emperor, so the second century after Christ. You can see that some of the details are really there. The aegis, the protective skin, the helmet with the three crests, the snake coiled inside the great shield, but the shield on the outside is plain. The base is plain, whereas in antiquity the base carried the birth of Pandora. And under the hand of Athena, there is a column but is that column really part of the original, or was it required by the fact that this is a marble figure, and therefore the hand and the arm would break with the weight of the Nike if you don't put some kind of support in it? Evidently, the Greeks who knew what the original looked like didn't feel that the column was intrusive. In fact, we have other representations. Another one, this really a statuette. This is only about this high, less than half a meter. This one has no column under the hand, but I show it to you from this angle because you can see that this one has a decorated shield, so that and this isn't finished moreover, so it doesn't have the elaborate helmet. So we get a little bit from one element and a little bit from another element, and then we have some at a very large scale, although not as big as the original Athena in Athens. This one for the city of Pergamon that became a very important center during the second century BC with the Attali rulers. And this one preserves some of the figures from the base. Yet the drapery is modernized. You can tell immediately that it's not the simple structural drapery of the figures of the fifth century, but it's actually much more animated, much more complicated, and various details have been simplified. So what archeologists are doing, they're trying to catch these echoes wherever they can, even sometimes in very small objects. This is a gem of the Augustan period that only reproduces the upper part of the Athena, but it gives you the necklace, it gives you the helmet, and the three crests. The date of this is the late first century BC. These are medallions from actually Kulova, South Russia. They are now in Leningrad. And again, you have Athena frontal face, the helmet, the crest. This is a coin, a coin of Athens, so that it was by putting all this information together that in 1971, a scholar for the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto decided to try making a replica of the Athena. And if you go to the ROM, to the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, this is what you see. This is one-tenth of the scale of the original Athena. And as far as I'm concerned, it really looks like a little doll. It's golden. It's golden because it has been gilded. The figures of the base are gilded. The shield has a decoration on the outside. But Neda Leipen, who is the scholar who did the study, decided that the column probably was symbolic, that it was an integral part, and she put it under the hand of the goddess. So far, so good. This is the state of our knowledge in 1971. But something else was happening. It's obvious that we cannot recapture the glory of the Parthenon anywhere else. You'll never have the same bright sunshine. You'll never have the same kind of rock. You never have the same temple that stands up almost as if it were exposed to the view of the people. But you can reproduce the physical details of the Parthenon. And several countries have tried. There is an unfinished one in Edinburgh, by the way, for those of you who are familiar with Scotland. This one, however, is in Nashville, Tennessee. And when I was a student on the Acropolis, I studied with the great William Dinsmore, who taught for many, many years at Columbia, and is still considered the Bible in terms of Greek architecture. 
And he was talking to us about the Parthenon, and every now and then would say, but the only really accurate reproduction of the Parthenon is the one that I curated in Nashville, Tennessee, because he had been instrumental in checking all the details. Obviously, they didn't choose marble. But they used some kind of uh, uh, river pebbles in order to give a sort of a golden tint to the concrete of the columns. And they tried to put in as much sculpture as possible and even some of the paint. And they certainly reproduce the dimensions exactly so that you can see the human scale and the figures and respected the idea of the three steps, although not even giants could have negotiated those three steps. And even in Athens, you would have had to have the supplementary one. They even introduced all the optical details that are so important a feature of the Parthenon, the great curvature of the platform on which the columns stand that can be measured. Actually, on the long side, from one end to the other of the long side of the Parthenon, if you measure the crest, the curvature is nine inches. So it's minimal considering the size of the Parthenon, but it's measurable, it's really there. And on the Acropolis in Athens, there is no question of sagging foundations because the rock had to be cut in order to accommodate the curvature. And to this day, we are not quite sure why they did it, except that it gives a sort of springiness to the whole structure, almost as if the temple were heaving under the weight and were trying to thrust upward, which makes it so eloquent and so uh, important even with the um, swelling of the columns. In Nashville, of course, they had to make the building functional. So they created an underground level, and uh, this is the entrance to the Nashville Parthenon that takes you down into a basement. And that is a gallery for artists, and it has a gift shop, and it has uh, rotating displays. And they had to provide for fire reasons, for fire requirements, a passage from the main cellar to the rear room. They also had to make windows in these uh, walls that house the great door on the east side. But to our great surprise, now that they are restudying the Parthenon in Athens, they found out that even that building in the fifth century had windows. So actually, when Manolis Corres, the architect that was working on the reconstruction of the Parthenon, went to Nashville, he said, how did you know? We only learned now. They said, no, we didn't know. We had to do it because of the requirements of the situation. But they did do everything else as close as possible to the original. And uh, William Dinsmore, indeed, was the one who supervised with particular interest the reconstruction of the main room, the cellar, and the interior colonnade. So that you can be sure that this space that can no longer be recovered in Athens is exactly replicated in Nashville. And to their great surprise, he, Dinsmore also provided for a strong platform at the point where the cult image would have been. Because even though there was no cult image at the time, he foresaw the possibility that maybe one day they would have added that. <laughs> now, obviously, they couldn't put up all the subjects of the metopes that had been defaced in the Athenian temple. So they repeated 10 of the best preserved metopes from the south side all around. But because of the paint, you can have a better impression of what the original looked like. They could not do the Ionic frieze. And they had to invent the central part of the gable because we no longer had these statues from the time of the Christian church. But here you can see Helios rising from the platform of the temple. You can see the reclining goddesses that we examined in detail before. You can actually see what we have that is minimal compared to how much we miss because the central part is all gone. And when you go to Nashville, this gives you a very good idea of how impressive these pediments would have been. And they could paint all the details the way they would have been in the Parthenon, the way you have the various moldings, so that once again, you get a better impression of what an ancient temple would have looked like. But in the cellar, even though you get the effect of the double colonnade, you are missing the centerpiece. They had a little statue there, and they had a box that they put on almost as a joke. This temple was started in 420, in 420, listen to me, in, in 1921. I'm still in the fifth century BC. Now this, this is AD. This was started in uh, 
1921 and was finished in 1931. And uh, in 1928 is when Dinsmore really supervised the construction of the cellar. So when it was open to the public in 1931, they put the little box there with the label that said, for the statue of Athena. And they didn't think anything of it until 1981. In 1981, they opened the box, and to their great amazement, they found that it had $36,000. So they had to do something, and by law, they were compelled to do something that corresponded to the purpose for which the money had been donated, because the sign said, for the statue of Athena. So they started consulting with lots of us who teach archaeology. And we all said, oh, come on, how are you going to make a golden ivory statue wherever we don't know what it looked like five years? Uh, no, they said, we're not going to try and make it in golden ivory, but we ought to make something comparable. They held a competition, and of course, this was something that scared all the young sculptors of the area, except for one, Alan Lequire, who at the time was young, and he decided, yes, he had always enjoyed classical sculpture. He was going to try. He won the competition. He went to Athens. He went to touch practically the base of the Athena Parthenos. And then he started consulting with uh, Professor Harrison at the Institute of Fine Arts, with me at Bryn Mawr, with Neda Leipen in Toronto. And he started the great work of building the Athena. So first he started well, with a model at one-tenth of the scale. And at that time, he used the human model because he was convinced that the balance that you see in all the marble replicas is really not correct. He went to measure the caryatids of the Erechtheion in Athens and tried the plumb line on the one in the British Museum to see how the weight had to fall when the stance was balanced. He also was convinced that there was no need for the column because he could cantilever the arm, and that would have been much better. So from the one that was one-tenth of the scale, he went to one that was one-fifth of the scale. And this is me in earlier days consulting with the sculptor, trying to tell him, no, I don't think she would have had such a tummy in ancient times. Maybe it would have been a little bit different. <laughs> we were discussing details of the drapery. But then, by and large, I said to him, you know, you are not going to be able to make five years statue. You're going to make your statue. So make it as true to yourself as you can but at the same time, try to be as faithful as possible, iconographically and in terms of dimensions. Because what will really be enormously valuable will be to see a piece of the same size in a cellar that is the exact size of the one in Athens. And so he started working. He had to have an armature, which looks pretty horrible. And he had to have quantity of clay. He actually had to have several tons of clay because uh, he built the statue in five huge sections. And uh, each time that a section was finished, he had to remodel the clay and reutilize it for the next section. Here you see that he has the original head of the one to a five scale, and he has magnified it. And as he magnifies it, he has to take into account the distortion that would occur when the statue is at complete height, because it would be seen from below, and it would be much higher, and therefore there were optical arrangements that had to be made. When the clay was finished to the point that all the details were there, it would be covered with a mantle. And here I feel confident that you know what I'm talking about. You can see the people dipping cloth in plaster. He had assistance, he had volunteer assistance, because of course there wasn't that much money. They would drape this all around the statue, then they would cut along certain lines, and they would have molds. And then from the molds, they could take casts. Here is the next section. You can see that he's now doing the lower part of the figure with the recycled clay. And here you can see some of the casts that have been taken from the molds. And you realize his trepidation every time that he destroyed what he had done because he wouldn't have been able to repeat it again. So he was very careful not to break his cast because otherwise the original clay was gone. He even had a fire, a major fire in his workshop that destroyed all his drawings in 1988. It was a major disaster. But then finally, when the statue was more or less complete, he could put it inside the cell itself. And here you can see it. it within the Parthenon in Nashville, with the scaffolding, they had to call on bridge builders who created not only the armature that had to be made in steel because uh, Nashville is on a, on a seismic fault. 
So uh, it had to be pretty safe. And then they had to create the scaffolding, and here is the sculptor himself. Uh, I ought to tell you a lot of anecdotes, but there is no time how you had to put the head in position with great trepidation, and he was so concerned about it that the bridge maker told him, we will do it tomorrow morning at nine, and they all went in at eight o'clock, and they put it up in position before he came, so that when he arrived, they said, the goddess Athena put it in place, it's there. <laughs> because he was having kittens, he was so terrified that they were not going to be able to put the head properly. And so he realized also that at this scale, with this enormous statue, which by the way is 13 meters 75, uh, is there, it's almost 42 feet. Uh, even the soles of the sandals that in the description of the ancient sources were said to be decorated with the central romaki, indeed were such a large space that they needed the extra decoration. And so here he had to devise the battle of Greeks and centaurs, but it made perfect sense because the sandals were huge sandals. And you can see here the detail of the head. The helmet he did right there in place in the Parthenon. The two lateral crests are supported by winged horses, pegasoi. And the crest in the center is supported by a sphinx. And he wanted to make the Sphinx more feminine than the Athena, because the Athena had to be terrible in a certain sense, because she's such a formidable goddess. And you can see her earrings, which again are imitated from reproductions of the time. And the shield, the shield was a major enterprise because it had 31 figures. And we knew that it was the battle of the Greeks and the Amazons. But these are the Amazons that are scaling the walls of Athens. And this is where Professor Eve Harrison of the Institute of Fine Arts was so instrumental because she had been studying the composition of the shield for many years, taking her inspiration from a variety of reliefs of later times. This was a shield that was quite famous in antiquity. So a model was made, then the one at full scale, which is actually 15 feet in diameter, and first the figures were engraved, and then he started filling in the figures in clay, again with the gorgon head in the center looking pretty horrible. And then finally, this is the shield completed in the Parthenon in Athens. This is Professor Harrison, for those of you who know her. And uh, this is Alan LeQuire. And then the statue base. This was perhaps the most difficult because there was very little evidence for the statue base. You saw the one in Pergamon that had very few figures from the center. So the artist did a little bit what he wanted. So he had an assistant who was from Japan. And so since uh, Helios comes from the east, he gave Helios rising at this particular point the features of his assistant. Uh, Pandora, who is the beautiful first woman, had the features of his girlfriend who is now his wife. And uh, Athena, who is uh, the inspiration in the birth of Pandora, is the face of Anne Roos, who was one of the members of the Parthenon uh, group that was instrumental in getting the sole enterprise moving despite all the difficulties. Uh, Hephaestus is his father, and so on. That is to say, you can see the traces of some of the people that had helped him and some of the people that were dear to him in the base without obviously destroying the illusion that you are still looking at something from fifth century Athens. And this is what the base looked like even at the moment of the first inauguration because it was decided from the very beginning that these figures were to be gilded against the background of the marble base. This is Pandora as a little statue and these are the various gods that bring her gifts and you remember the famous box of Pandora which was actually a jar that contained all the evils and they all escaped and ruined the human race except for hope which remained at the bottom of the jar, but hope therefore means that it was also an evil, but that's something that we should not discuss. <laughs> However, then on the 21st of May, 1990, the statue was completed and it was inaugurated. And I was there at the inauguration and all sorts of people and dignitaries were called in. You can see what she's like finished. She has a weight on one leg, the other one is relaxed she holds her shield down at her foot, which means she has finished fighting. She's not going to grab it up in a hurry, she holds it at rest. And so is the spear. 
which, by the way, was a flagpole from McDonald, donated by McDonald, because they didn't know how to make the spear otherwise. The snake is er, familiar, is the great symbol of the peace in Athens, uh, a, a, a creature of the earth, and he coils inside her shield, and in her hand she has victory coming to crown her because the feat is accomplished, the world is at peace. Not at peace necessarily of the Greeks against the Persians, but the, Gre the victory of the gods against the giants, because we have to remember that these monuments might have had political undertones, but at the same time, they also had a great religious impact. The people here looked at the Statue of Athena and saw their goddess. They did not see uh, a symbol of Pericles' power. Because you saw how little that uh, Nike looked on her hand, here is myself for scale next to it. She is six foot four. And yet, on the hand of the Athena, she looks almost like a little bird that has gone to crown the goddess. So you can see that when you challenge it with the human scale, these are enormous proportions. And in fact, at the time of the inauguration, when the doors were open and we could glimpse the statue in the interior, it was impressive how it seemed to jump out at us. It was such a dominant presence. The only thing we could think of was a sense of awe. As a matter of fact, there were people picketing because they were saying we were bringing back the pagan gods, which of course was not at all the intention, but Nashville is called uh, the belt buckle of the South, the, the, of the Bible, the, the Bible belt. The Nashville is supposed to be the buckle. We had the exiled king of Greece who gave a speech. We had uh, a Greek priest who gave his blessing. So this was really quite a ceremony, except that, of course, the Athena was still white. So then they decided that they needed to gild it in order to have the complete effect of the Athena as a gold and ivory work. We needed to have the total effect. And so they raised again money. It took quite a while. But eventually, the 5th of September, 2002, they inaugurated the Gilded Athena. And I was there for the inauguration. And these are now the first slides that you can see of them. That is the same Nike, the same six foot four Nike with the gold wreath in her hand. And the face has been tinted. In the original, the flesh parts would have been in ivory, but that too touched by paint to emphasize the individual figures, features, and then the body, the drapery, would have been covered with gold foil. They had to call specialists to apply the gold foil because this is a very difficult process and the foil is really very thin. The Athena was painted. We know that she had blue eyes from the ancient sources, although I doubt that anybody ever saw the goddess Athena. And you can see the very elaborate helmet you can see her necklace and the scales of the aegis. The shield is very dramatic with the various figures in gold and the uh, braid pattern all around has been left white to imitate ivory. This probably would have been in ivory and there would have been glass paste colored into the eyes of the braid the way the uh, gorgonion, the face of the gorgon, is rendered as if it were in ivory. And then here was the most surprising part because the interior of the shield had to be also decorated. And the sculptor followed again Professor Harrison's understanding that probably the interior of the shield would have been a great ivory plaque and that the figures would have been painted. And he tried to use images that correspond to vase painting of the period so that he can have the battle of the gods and the giants. And one of the things that was very surprising is how this shape of the hollow shield lends itself beautifully to convey the effect of the sky, the vault of the sky, and then down the earth down below, as well as the exterior of the shield conveys very well the climbing of the Amazons toward the peak of the Acropolis and the bodies falling off the walls. I don't know if you can see the details from the distance, but of course, this is 15 feet. So when you are in Nashville, these figures really stand out and you can see the whole surface of the shield bristling with armor. And in the interior, despite the great snake, 
with thousands of scales picked out in gold, you would have been able to see the painted decoration, the gods defeating the giants and therefore triumphing over chaos and establishing the forces of order. And so now here is the Athena as it appears in Nashville. And for some reason, I don't know why there is a black spot on the slide. I'm sorry, I only noticed it tonight. I assure you it's not on the one in Nashville. It's a very impressive figure. Here too, when the festivities were finished and the lights were turned off, the gold was still glowing. It was such an impression, uh, such an effect that we hadn't visualized. And now you might say, what is this, Disney World? Is this what we're trying to do? No, what we have learned is really enormous in terms of what we know now of ancient Athens. First of all, we have realized that the fame of Phidias was not for the various sculptures of the pediments, of the metopes, of the friezes, but it was for this tremendous achievement of making a statue of this kind. We also realize that what was impressive to them was not the individual style, which we trained from the Renaissance, think is the most important part of an artist's work. No, there for them it was the size itself, it was the material itself, it was the achievement of creating something in gold and ivory. Because don't forget that these materials were mostly coming from the East. So this too was an allusion to the wealth of the Persians, to the um, allure, let's say, of the uh, different culture that made the gods above the humans because they were so enormous, so inaccessible, so fierce. But also look at the rest. Look how well it fits within the colonnade. All of a sudden you realize why the plan included this return of columns so that they created the backdrop for the Athena. And if you look at it at the proper level, the Nike is exactly at the level of the architrave. This has been taken from down below. But if you were to be able to see it from the entrance, from the doors of the temple, you would see that the Nike falls exactly at the level of the architrave of the first order of columns. And you also realize that Alan Lequire was completely correct in eliminating the column under the arm of Athena because the cantilever principle was very well known in fifth century and was used in architecture in a variety of ways. So you understand now what made these figures so important for the Greeks. They were awesome. Athena was not a daily figure. She was a goddess. And when I say awesome, I want to use the word in the proper term, not the way my children used to say, oh man, dinner tonight was awesome. Not that. <laughs> the, the awesomeness of the God that can, in, in, can in, install fear in human beings as well as uh, help a sense of help. If you are defended by such a formidable goddess, Athens is going to survive forever. So I think we have learned a great deal by recreating something that is exactly the ancient size in a building that is exactly like the ancient one. And even though I'm sure that poor Alan Lequire, if he had known it ahead how many years it was going to toil on this, he might not have taken on such an enterprise. I think we are all in his debt. And I hope that many of you will have a chance to go and see the Athena in Nashville and maybe feel inspired in your own work to give us something. I want to finish with the very contemporary notes because I'm sure many of you today have watched television and they have seen over and over and over again the statue of Saddam Hussein that was being toppled down from the pedestal. This is the power of images. Images have a tremendous power. We shouldn't think of it as a statue. We shouldn't think of it as something that was made either in Nashville or even in Athens. I'm sure that the Athena had for the Athenians the same enormous symbolism that the statues of the rulers have today, and especially the statues and the images of the gods. So it's in your hands. Remember, you are the sculptors. You have the power. I hope you will make very good use of it. Thank you. <laughs>